diverted from the landfill. All cups, plates, cutlery, and food from this event can be composted. So you can bring that all over there to Morgan, who is standing in the back right there. Our snacks today were sourced locally through Grow Food Carolina. My name is Isabel Sweet. I'm a senior here at the college, majoring in business administration and minoring in studio art. I have been working at the Office of Sustainability for three semesters now. I started off by volunteering in our Greek chair and garden apprenticeship program, and then became a rotation intern working with social media, zero waste, and the Residence Life Initiatives. This semester, my co-leader and I started a new project at the office, which focuses on oceanic conservation and awareness, with the hope that this will help reduce human impact on our local waterways. We call our project the 71% because 71% of the Earth's surface is covered in water, and our actions impact every drop of that. We started off by focusing on the topic of sustainable seafood this semester, and a major part of that topic will be discussed in today's event. We are excited to feature these great panelists for our last Green Bag Lunch of the year. Today, our moderator will be Elena Bugas. Elena is the co-leader of the 71%, who is also a senior at the college, majoring in marine biology and minoring in archaeology and environmental studies. This is her second semester at the office. Previously, she was a rotation intern working on the zero waste and social media initiatives. Besides working at the office, Elena is also doing independent study research on microplastic sound and sands from around the world. Please help me welcome Elena Bugas. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Isabel, for the wonderful introduction. I'm so excited to be moderating this discussion and hearing what our panelists and the audience have to contribute to the topic of sustainable seafood. Today's agenda will be a brief introduction of the topic by the panelists, followed by questions, then we will open the discussion to the audience. We have three panelists today, Dr. Gorka Sancho, biology professor here at the college, Shelly Dearhart, manager of the Good Catch program at the South Carolina Aquarium, and Chef Drew Headland, executive chef at Fleet Landing Restaurant. Thank you all for being here today. We will start with a brief video giving an introduction to sustainable seafood. This is a fish. Some fish are wild, which means a fisherman caught them out of the ocean. Other fish are farmed, which means they were raised in an enclosed aquaculture system, like a cow farm, but in the water. And they're endless fish in the sea, right? Wrong. Let's start with the wild ones. Wild fish are being caught in a way that cannot last. 85% of the world's fisheries are currently being overtaxed, meaning wild fish are being caught at a faster rate than they can reproduce. Here's another problem that comes up with wild fish. Some fishing methods catch all kinds of additional sea life that end up dying as a result. This is called bycatch. For instance, trawls get dragged along the ocean floor, disrupting the ecosystem and catching sea turtles and unwanted fish. Long lines snag tons of innocent bycatch as well. These methods are definitely not sustainable. A wild fish is sustainable if it's caught in a way that doesn't threaten the long-term survival of its species or the ecosystem it's a part of. Hook and line fishing, harpooning, and some uses of traps are often more sustainable methods of catching fish. With these methods, bycatch is minimal and unwanted fish can be released. Okay. So now let's talk about fish farms. Seems like they're happy places, right? Well, not always. Some farm-raised fish are from poorly run fish farms. They pollute the oceans with their waste. They also risk releasing their fish into the wild, and since farm fish are often genetically different from wild fish, this can change the wild populations that upset the natural ecosystem. A sustainable farm is careful about keeping their fish separate from wild populations, what they feed their fish, and what they're putting in the ocean. So, you're partial to your sushi, but you don't want to be a selfish jerk. What can you do? Well, if you're going to eat fish, make sure it's sustainable. Sustainability is on a fish-by-fish -fish basis, so being responsible takes a little bit of work, but it's worth it. Here's how you find sustainable fish without having to memorize a long list of options. First, check the label. For farmed fish, look for the Aquaculture Stewardship Council logo. And for wild fish, look for the Marine Stewardship Council logo. Next, try to shop at supermarkets that only stock fish from responsible farms and fisheries. The best options are Whole Foods, Safeway, Whiteman's, and Trader Joe's. Finally, download Monterey Bay Aquarium's app, Seafood Watch. Then when you shop, you can enter the name of any fish and know whether or not to buy it. This is a sustainable fish. Let's keep it that way. Okay. 
Okay, great. Um, Dr. Zarka, we'll start with you. Okay, so um, thank you for having me here. And I was asked a little bit to introduce um, what is overfishing and what are the present uh, fisheries management schemes that are occurring in the world. Um, you saw in the video here a certain uh, data. Uh, it depends where you go and to get your data, you'll get different kind of numbers because the definition of what overfishing is is a very um, relaxed definition and people are still arguing what overfishing is. If you go to the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization, they will say that 30% of the fish stocks in the ocean are overfished, 60% are fully fished, and 10% are underfished. So according to those data, we think that all the oceans are in a pretty good state. The argument here is overfishing is very obvious. Um, when you fish too much in a few number of years, your numbers start decreasing, 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 and you run out of fish. The problem is what is fully fished. Fully fished in principle is a sustainable fish in the sense that your number of individual fishes does not vary in time. Unfortunately, uh, over historical times, we realized that those uh, fisheries that are fully fished are not really sustainable in numbers, but over time, fishery after fishery has eventually crashed or diminished their capture. So if you consider that a fully fished uh, fishery is not well managed and you're catching too much, then it turns out that 90% of the world uh, ocean fish stocks are being overfished. And there's still argument going over fully fished versus not. Now the reality is that since 1990s, uh, the wild fish catch in the ocean has been stable and flat a little bit, decreasing a little bit. But we already have over 15 years of flat catches, actually 25 years of flat catches in the ocean. Now, you might think like, well, we're in a sustainable place, uh, our catches are not varying. The reality is that they are decreasing because our fishing effort has kept on increasing. Okay, we have actually new boats, more boats, and then we have new boats with new technology going after the fish. So it's taken more effort to catch the same amount of fish that 25 years ago, and we're not catching more. And this is a little concern that uh, there is a big recognition about general overfishing. Now, in fisheries management, uh, typically they're managed by individual countries, but individual countries only have jurisdiction over their in uh, national waters, which typically extend 200 miles from the coastlines. Now that includes a lot of valuable uh, shallow water and coastal species, but the majority of the oceans are what are called international waters, far away from the coastline. And those uh, fisheries are not managed by individual countries. There are international uh, agreements by multiple countries to try to regulate those fisheries, but uh, overall they have a pretty poor record of getting 15, 20 countries together on a green and something. So they're very ineffective. Within national waters, uh, as always, it depends which country you're dealing with. The United States, for example, has a very good track record of protecting its fisheries. Uh, they invest a lot of money in doing so. At the same time, and the United States has actually some very decent fisheries. But there are many other countries in the world that have very valuable fisheries that have that are responsible for managing them. But you can imagine places like Iran, Afghanistan, and countries that have major other problems to deal with. Uh, the management of fisheries is not done in a sustainable way. Most of them, they are overfishing them themselves, or they're giving the rights of fisheries to international companies to come and fish, and the regulation is low. Uh, one of the major players in the world is China, uh, and China, uh, during the 1990s, was part of a big scandal because they were saying they were catching so many fish, when it turns out that they were completely lying to these international organizations. And it's very normal for people to go to the United Nations and directly lie as a political white line, saying, well, we were supposed to catch so many fish, and we caught so many. The reality is that those data are not vested in any way, shape, or form, and those numbers. So it's very hard to track, really, how many fish are being caught in the world. What we know a little bit better is how many fish are being sold in the world, but that is, it has a dollar sign to it, a money sign, and there are commercial transactions about that. But it's very hard to control how many fish are being caught and left dead in the bottom, or sold illegally somehow, etc. Um, I was also asked to ask about the negative and positive aspects of fisheries management. And um, 
management usually has good goals. The goal is to have sustainable fisheries, and that will reduce management. That will be the actual goal. Is this achieved or not? It depends. The problem that happens with a lot of the fisheries is that it is a joint interest of conservation, sustainability, with the other objective, which is a capitalistic uh, profit part. And it's very hard for fishing companies uh, to stay of the same size because the capitalistic market economy sort of promotes the companies to keep on growing. And if a fishing company starts growing, they start needing to catch more fish, and this is where you get into what came first, the egg or the chicken. I need to make more money, I need to catch more fish. I want to do it sustainably, but I need more fishes. Where are the sustainable fish? So with that, I'll finish, and I'll definitely answer questions afterwards. Thank you, Dr. Rafael. Shelly? Right. Um, and so I, I hope that kind of gave you a little bit of a glimpse of how complicated fishery use is in general, uh, especially when it comes to sustainability. Um, there's not a lot of cut and dry easy answers um, when it when it comes to this topic, and you know that can make things super confusing from the, the consumer side of things. Um, just to give you a little bit of a background for those of you who are not familiar with Good Catch, uh, we just rebranded actually as of last October to be Good Catch. Before that, uh, we were the Sustainable Seafood Initiative, and that was a program that started back in 2002, um, and we primarily focused on working with chefs and restaurants because when you when you look at again how complicated that the topic of fisheries is and, and doing things in a, a responsible way um, it's just overwhelming all of it to a consumer um, it can be if that's not what you live and breathe every day and so kind of taking that weight off of their shoulders and working with <coughs> chefs uh, you know allowed us to hopefully give people in our community a menu that they didn't have to necessarily think about all those details about, am I doing the right thing? Um, and so we did that for years and years, um, have a fantastic foundation of over 125 restaurants, um, pardon me, Fleet being one of our most active and just amazing partners, um, that, that have made this dedication and commitment to serving sustainably sourced seafood. It's becoming more and more of a trend, I think, in the culinary world, which is making things a little easier from that perspective, but that doesn't take away from still needing to work with from from the consumer side. There are still a lot of questions out there, and and um, and I think you know when it comes to what what is sustainable, I think that that question is still really confusing to a lot of people because to be quite honest, everybody has a different definition for it. If you look at our our definition at the aquarium, we basically um, it, it's some ver ver variety or some version of it depending on what organization you're you're looking at, but ours is uh, you know, looking at the long-term viability of a species, whether farmed or fished, but also considering the, the ecosystem balance as a whole. So obviously you wanna um, kind of take a look at the particular biology of the fish and are we overfishing it and look at the, um, the management side of things from the species perspective, but then you also wanna look at how it's being harvested. You have to take into consideration, you know, are we pulling trawls over, you know, hard, rocky bottom or coral reef and are we damaging the ecosystem for not only that fish but every other fish that finds a home there. Um, so definitely can be still a lot of a lot of information um, when it comes to well how do I make the right choice if, if I go to a restaurant and maybe they aren't a partner at Good Catch. Um, and so we to kind of briefly move in, I don't know how much if I have enough I think I'm doing okay. Um, I, um, we have a, a new consumer campaign called Ask Before You Order. And so what we're trying to encourage folks to do is just learn a little bit more about their seafood before they financially um, support a business that may not be making good decisions when it comes to the environment. And so uh, simply asking where is it from, um, we have some of the strictest management in the entire world when it comes to fisheries in the United States. And so is it is it always a perfect answer? No, I, I'm not going to be able to tell you that. But when you're looking at what can I do? It's a good start to look for a, an item that's coming from the United States. And if your provider can't tell you that confidently, don't buy it. Um, so what, what you're looking at, and I apologize for my voice. I'm, I've been losing it the past two days. <laughs> but um, So what you're looking for is confidence, and you want to really start building a relationship with your provider. Um, the more you ask questions, the more they're going to expect those questions and be prepared to answer with hopefully confidence and recognize that they need to be proud of the product they're selling you um, before they take your money for it. So um, let's see, 
trying to see what else I need to cover here. So that being said, um, I was asked to talk a little bit about trash fish as well. So trash fish, are you guys familiar with that term? Some of you maybe, some of you not. Okay. Um, it's kind of a trendy term that there's a group called the Chefs Collaborative that um, started doing these trash fish dinners around the United States. We actually had one here, I think about a year ago, um, where you're highlighting underutilized species. And so there are species that you wouldn't necessarily normally anticipate seeing on a menu, things like amberjack or mackerel or um, uh, I'm trying to think of one, porgy even for that matter. You just aren't necessarily used to seeing those fish prepared on a menu. You want to see you want mahi and grouper, and those are the easy go-tos. You're familiar with those. Um, but if you see something maybe that you're not as familiar with, keep an open mind and consider ordering that fish or asking about that fish and why it's a good choice. And um, hopefully, again, our chefs, which I'm going to let Drew transition here in a second, but tell you he's phenomenal when it comes to using underutilized species. We just did a dinner with him, and he focused on all underutilized species, um, or 90% anyway. Like, yeah. It's awesome. And they're all delicious. You just have to know how to prepare those fish and, and be open to trying them. Yeah, I mean, a lot of um, a lot of what we do at Fleet, um, you know, we kind of target these these species that don't get used because um, it hits on, a, on a many cylinders. So um, not only are we, you know, being this steward um, to the oceans that, you know, we're, we're able to get something that is underutilized that may, you know, honestly, in the past get turned into cat food or turned into, you know, something else. Um, and these are all really good, really good tasting fish. Um, I really don't like the term trash fish. I mean, it's really, uh, I don't know, it's just kind of degrading that the, the, the species of the jolts and the amberjacks, they're, they're underutilized. Um, Cause I don't think chefs really, you know, in the past really wanted to dedicate time it's a little more challenging to, to kind of figure out what to do with the flavor profiles and make them work uh, for your menus. But um, especially here in Charleston, I mean, one of the culinary meccas um, on the east, um, I mean, there are a lot of really, really talented chefs that um, you know dedicate their time and to you know making these things you know just awesome, taste great. Um, I think I answered that. Um, um, the ask before you order. So, to kind of springboard off of what Shelley was saying, um, you know, I mean, you're you're definitely voting with your dollar every time you go out to a restaurant or you go to Crosby's or you know wherever to purchase your food. Um, it's a simple choice, and it's a fresh choice and a flavorful choice. And to me, it's just a really really easy choice to make. Uh, when you go out, and it's just supporting the local economy. It, it, again, it just it hits on really all cylinders. Um, they, they, one of the questions here is to ask me, and I'm kind of probably going to defer to to Shelley on this. We we get our um, fish from commercial dealers, um, and so Shelley might have a little bit better grasp on who locally, if you're willing to, if you're wanting to purchase fish um, at a market, you can go out to, and, you know, there's Tarvin and Whole Foods. And, um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and actually, do you have these like available? Maybe I, I can. We can. We can email. We can even <laughs> email them to you. But um, so some of these people I, um, I'm familiar with, Clamber Dave, and a lot of these guys, um, you'll see, you'll you'll hear a lot of these people in people's menus. Um, chefs are real keen on exploiting that fact that you know this is my oysterman and this is my fisherman and this is where I get stuff um, from St. Jude's Farm, Abundant Seafood, um, Tarvin Seafood, um, Kimberly's Crabs, uh, Magwin and Suds obviously um, you know the big shoppers here in town, um, Ladies Island Oysters who we use um, quite frequently at um, Fleet when they're in season. Um, so if you guys would like to take a look at this um, at the end, we can certainly email it to you and get you a copy. Um, now we have some questions for all of you. Um, is sustainable seafood the answer to overfishing or just a step to solve an issue? Okay. I'll start. <laughs> um, in my personal opinion, it's a step towards solving the issue. Um, and one of the reasons why you're going to know all the fish are eventually to be sold to people, first of all, defining what's sustainable is tricky. 
mentioned before in the video the Marine Stewardship Council, which one of, was one of the first initiatives to try to determine what's sustainable seafood at a global scale. Um, it started by scientists and World Wildlife Foundation about 20 years ago with all the best intentions of the world. And it's sort of grown into this big uh, corporation almost. Uh, and they have many sustainable fisheries, but lately they've been getting a lot of criticism for incorporating many non-sustainable fisheries. And their problem is there's such a demand for sustainable fisheries, there's really not that many sustainable fisheries to supply all the demand of all the people. So right now, the fishers from Whole Food and from Walmart are, in principle, Marine Stewardship Council. They're not bad, but I, you can probably go there and start picking non-sustainable species among the ones that they give you. So it's part of the solution, but it's uh, not the only part of the solution. Yeah, I mean, I would definitely mirror that. I mean, it's a spoke of the wheel. Um, it's daunting for me as a chef to wade through all this information. Um, you guys kind of saw in the video the MSC stamp on there. Um, you would, you know, kind of consider that, oh, that's a good thing. Well, there's a lot of money behind producing those um, MSC stamps for these fish. So it's um, it's daunting to wade through, but I, I, you know, sustainable fishery fishing will definitely help in, in the long term for sure. Um, I mean, I'm going to say the same thing, basically. I, but I think uh, there are a lot of other factors, too, that aren't necessarily um, as much in the forefront. I know I've read in the news a ton lately about human trafficking issues that are going on in um, Thailand and some other countries. And, um, you know, that's, that's a big, that's a massive issue when it comes to sustainable fisheries. But it's not just, you know, I mean, it, it, you just, you have you, you have to think about all of those things, and that's such a bigger issue than just are we doing things right right here. You know, I mean, there are just so many factors when it comes to sustainable fisheries, um, all of the illegal trade that's going on, um, trying to manage that, and it, you know, it's I think it's a step. It's definitely a step moving in the right direction, but we have a lot of other branches that we have to kind of think about. <laughs> Thank you. Um, this is for Dr. Gorka. Um, what is aquaculture, and in your opinion, is that a sustainable solution for overfishing? Um, aquaculture is the equivalent of uh, farming, in the sense that you have fish in captivity and you grow them for human consumption. Um, aquaculture uh, has been growing since wildcats have been flat since the 1990s. Aquaculture has been kept growing. Now, if you break aquaculture into two groups, first, marine aquaculture, which are typically towards high-end fishes of high value, that one has not grown in the last, and it's not growing at all for multiple reasons. Mainly, it's very expensive to grow fishes in the ocean if it's not right on the coastline, and coastline has all the benefits. And if you put a fish farm right in front of um, Isle of Palms, you'll get sued and will not be allowed because fish farms tend to be stinky and problematic, etc. So the majority of the growth of the also marine fishes are fed other fishes, so it gets very expensive. The majority of the aquaculture growth has been occurring in southeastern Asia, mostly in China, Thailand, and their freshwater aquaculture, so basically associated with rice paddies and rice cultivation. So they have been growing a lot, and they're responsible for supplying fish to Southeast Asia in huge amounts. And there are species that don't make the United States market, the freshwater carp and freshwater species that the United States has no grown taste for them other than Chinese communities, so they basically fish it that stay in southeastern Asia, but they have a very big importance for feeding that part of the world. Mr. Hart, why should people care about where their seafood is coming from? I think there's a variety of reasons to care about where your seafood is coming from. Um, if, if, if sustainability and the ocean and a, a balance um, in that ocean is important to you, obviously you want to be supporting an industry that also shares those same values. Um, in addition to that, I mentioned the human trafficking issue. You don't, I mean, I would hope nobody would want to support a fishery that utilizes those kind of practices. Um, and it's a hard thing to figure out. And I think that's, what, again, why I go back to looking at, you know, some simple kind of go-tos until you are able to learn more and verse yourself a little bit better about specific farms or specific uh, fisheries. Um, looking for it to come from the United States is kind of a, a kind of a, Again, not perfect, but quick and easy go-to if you need to make a decision on the fly. Um, and, it, and again, as you're progressively learning about it. Um, but I think, you know, you, we really just need to be thinking about the values we have and what we want to promote living our lives every day. 
and so many things come back to the ocean um, and sustainable fisheries and the choices you make in the grocery store, at a fish market, at a restaurant. Um, I mean, we're eating every day. I mean, you may not eat seafood every day, but you're eating every day. And, um, you know, all of those choices obviously play a role in, in fixing the bigger problem. I think, sorry not to go on, but I think, um, you know, somebody was, I was just talking with somebody today about, um, you know, how, how do you really think you're going to make a difference if I make this one decision right here? But, I mean, it's the same story. I mean, everybody just needs to start actually taking that active role and, and, Yes, it does make a difference, but everybody needs to do it to, to make that bigger difference. So um, you're selling yourself short if you think you're not part of that um, solution there. We would now like to open up the discussion to the audience. Is there any questions? Um, I'm just curious, you know, we've got 85% of the, uh, you know, fishing, fisheries are either in decline or destroyed. Um, and we've already got corporations seem to be, you know, we've got the fox in the hen house. Uh, I don't trust a lot of corporations to say what's sustainable. Uh, I feel like there's a lot of cereal uh, depletion where you eliminate one fish and then move on down to the next fish and so on and so forth. And so obviously we're, we haven't been sustainably fishing. Uh, what about the radical idea of not eating fish? I mean, if we don't, if we care about our oceans and we want to see them rebound, uh, maybe leaving fish off our plate entirely, you said. Why, why isn't that one of the things that we put up there as a, as a, as a reasonable approach to saving the oceans? Um, I would imagine that in the United States that would be possible, but considering that there's 800 million people of humans malnourished, and many of them coming from coastal communities in the third world, their source of food tends to be a main location fish. They don't have access to agriculture. Uh, the agriculture is very far away or it's been sent, but they don't have actually access to that. And if you think, for example, of Southeastern Asia, and other than rice, fish is the only other source, especially of protein for them. And coastal Africa is a major problem. They survive on fish, and that's their, that's their food intake. So there's a problem in the world. If you look at the eight <coughs> top uh, species caught in the world in volume, in the United States, you can only find two of them in the market. And you can only find them in the form of camps, really. Uh, all the rest are fish that don't don't make it to the United States market. I should take that one is the Alaskan pollock. You rarely can find a fillet of Alaskan pollock. But you'll find Alaskan pollock and a million other fish-like products like fake crab legs, fake yeah. this, fake that. It's all basically Alaskan pollock, which actually has its purpose. But well, those markets that you mentioned are they using the intensive fishing methods that we see right now? The the, the giant. Uh, soup nets and everything else, or are they smaller individual people fishing that probably are unable to really deplete the oceans in the same level that these giant corporate fishing industries are able to do? So I think if you give people a harpoon or a fishing rod, it's going to be tough for them to deplete the ocean, but if you give them a sieve net and radar, um, they can do some damage, right? Unfortunately, reality is it's both. Both. So they have the locals going more locally and then big corporations giving good money to these countries to have their base of fleets and hiring their own employees from their countries. So it's both. Um, I have a question about um, sort of the fishing industry and the Some of the, I mean, some of the places that I go on a daily basis, um, I always, I mean, I, I use Seafood Watch. I always try and stay current with what their recommendations are. I go to um, fishwatch.gov. It's a NOAA-related um, sustainable seafood site. Um, so much information there. You can find a ton of sources um, uh, for various articles um, on, you know, what's, what's happening, current events. Seafood Source is another good, um, good choice. Um, and then there's also fish choice, and that's more, it's, it's, it's turning into something that consumers can use as well, um, but it's been traditionally more of a um, kind of restaurant-oriented uh, sourcing um, website, but you can get a lot of, of great information from any of those spots. So. Uh, I tasted great for a local restaurant uh, recently, and I tried to ask the white person where it came from. I, uh, had the idea that maybe a grouper is fished off of wrecks, that uh, artificial reefs, that maybe that's less of an impact on the natural world. You guys can correct me on that. So, but I'm 
I'm just wondering, the person didn't know, didn't offer to find out. So I'm wondering what is the etiquette for um, being a little more consistent and saying, well, I really would like to know where this fish came from. They probably don't know. So like, what can we do about that? Ah, uh, yeah. No, um, <laughs> it's yours. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess I don't really have an answer because we don't, at Fleet, all of our servers have to know. Yeah. Um, and it's kind of, so we have a directional every morning and um, right before service. Um, so it identifies, you know, what the vegetable of the day is um, if we're low on anything. But it also identifies where our oysters are from today, yeah. where our fish is coming from today. Yeah. Um, so our servers are, you know, I mean, it's part of their training. They have to know. Um, otherwise, they don't work for us. Um, you know, Shelly, uh, you know, has come several times to speak to our service staff um, just about, you know, the sustainability of a certain item. You know, say that, you know, bee liners come around, you know, they're back in season. She'll come in and, and talk to the, uh, you know, the service staff and let them know. But the, that ongoing training that, that she kind of offers um, and information, I mean, it's, it's a powerful, powerful thing. I mean, Especially when I have tourists come, come in and sit at our tables and they're like, you know, what do you have today? Well, we've got this great jewelhead porgy and they, they got an iPad and like, here's the chef with the box of fish and it's like just came in. It sells itself. The people are like, that's what I want. So it really ought to, when I make the reservation, I would ask them if they can tell me where the fish came. <laughs> Maybe that's a different, yeah. Yeah, you could. I think, and I just wanted to add to that point because um, obviously he sees it from the inside and I think from on the outside looking in, you know, everybody's always discouraged because they're like, well, I do ask and nobody ever knows. What am I supposed to do with that? And the whole purpose of asking is that you continue to do it so that they slowly, it's not going to happen overnight, but slowly that, hopefully that movement will start, that we will see more restaurants like Drew's where the servers are just expected to like offer the information when they are telling you about the special as opposed to having you wait to ask, you know. As a server, if you get questions over and over and over again, you're going to say something like, guys, do we not know what this is? People keep asking, people keep bringing it up. Most of your wait staff will do something with that information. If they hear it once every three months, it's no big deal. If they hear it, especially from regulars, every time they come, that's a game changer. My question is for Chef Drew. Um, what was the kind of catalyst to make you want to um, serve more um, either uh, abundant fish or fish um, kind of in season here in Charleston? Um, well, so I'm originally from Florida, um, and I'll just keep it real short. But I, I moved up here. Um, I, I've always been around the ocean or the Gulf, and um, on my days off, if I'm not in the kitchen, I'm normally out on the water fishing. Um, but to me, it was, it's always been really important to be this you know, kind of steward to the to, to work to your waterways. Um, and so, uh, when I was hired at Fleet, um, that was kind of the mentality that the owner shared, and so it was a perfect fit for me. And that's why it just you know is taken off. But um, it's also really beneficial, and um, I, don't, I don't want to say heartwarming, but it's um, empowering when you've got um, you know these fishermen behind you that are. You know, bring you these fabulous products that you get to share with your, your guests. Um, this might be for Chef Drew, maybe even Shelly, but I work in a restaurant as well, and our servers definitely, like, they, during lineup, they learn where the bread's from, or the vegetables, sure. all that stuff. And customers love it. They love, like, yeah. they will get into really long conversations about, like, where this fish is from. Um, but with that, I know, like, we're definitely known for our mussels. Um, and most of our mussels rib? we get from, yeah. <laughs> 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 most of our mussels we get from New England. Yeah. Um, which is where I'm originally from. We get a lot from Mass, Rhode Island, yeah. and stuff like that. When you say that you want to look for like local stuff, or at least start in the U.S., do you like where do you draw the line with like, oh, this is local, like from South Carolina, or oh, this is local, like from the U.S. and it's like it's still halfway across the country. Like, how do you determine like? Well, I mean, I think the comment was made. All I think Dr. Morgan said it. I mean, if it has, if it's an American product, I mean, we're the most well-regulated country with, with regards to fishing. Uh, and some of my fishermen would, would dare say that we're a little overregulated, um, to be honest. Um, but, you know, making those choices, you know, using domestic products is, is, an, is an easy, you know, way to, to, for us, for us to choose. Um, obviously, we take a lot of guidance 
there's a lot of information out there. So we'll take guidance from Shelly. We'll take guidance from Noah. We'll take guidance from other other chefs. Um, you know, I go to the Boston Seafood Show every year, and I sit in a lot of the uh, you know uh, panels that, that just like this that go on. Um, it's a lot to wade through, and I kind of stay kind of down the middle because you've got fishermen saying this, and then you have the scientists saying this, and I, I think that there's a, a medium in the middle where you need to, to, to be because it's a it's an ever moving target, and I don't think that you can. What, what I'm saying today might be sustainable and is a good fish for me and tomorrow may not be. So I hope I hope I I'm just going to add to it actually. Um, from something else to just keep in mind when you're asking about that, that definition of what is local, everybody has a different opinion yeah. and what is a definition to him, his consumer may not agree with. And so at a point when you're going out to, to dine, you know, you just have to make those decisions for yourself. Like, you know, some people are, you know, dead set that they're only going to eat wild caught Alaskan salmon, but well, the maybe an Atlantic salmon that was farmed is closer, and so for some people, that distance traveled may make more of a difference as opposed to whether it's wild caught or farmed. You know, so it's you, you kind of it is a little bit there's a little bit of ownership on you as an individual just to, you know, figure out what's important to you and and educate yourself on the topic as a whole, and then you can make those decisions because. You know, just because, yeah, again, like Drew makes a decision doesn't mean it's going to be right for everybody. And I think you're definitely right that the, your vote counts is where you spend your dollars. Because um, we've gotten mussels from other places that are like locally South Carolina, and they're like much smaller. And people like actually get mad. They're like, we don't want to eat this. This isn't like why we came here. So yeah. then I guess it does just kind of really depend on the consumer what they want. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, the other part of you know, the other part of that is, that, you know, I'm, I'm running a business. So, um, you know, it, it would be great. I, I'm not going to say that 100% of the seafood that I serve is, is sustainable. It has to hit, you know, the majority of it is. But, you know, for to make it work as on a business model, I mean, I, I got to keep the doors open. So there are certain things that we really, really focus on, and then there are other things that are not as important to us. And, and I think that that goes with, you know, just being a restaurant operator. I wanted to put a, interject a little bit too and say that there's also a lot of very valuable sustainable fisheries that occur, for example, in poor third world countries. And they have no market in their own country for those fish, while an American or European person is very willing to pay good money for those fish. So blocking them off with a local only, sometimes it kills their market. So there's a lot of third world sustainable fisheries that the majority of the fish that we eat in the United States is frozen at some point, meaning it's perfectly stable and restaurants like that frozen because it doesn't go to waste. So there's a lot of third world country fish that is sustainable, and if it makes it to your table, you're actually making a big favor of helping a local fisherman in some faraway country. Good question. Um, and aquaculture in general on large scale can be really unsustainable environmentally. And I met, like in Thailand, they just like move from plot of land to plot of land, like leaving behind these toxic vegetables because it's not long term sustainable. Um, I was just wondering if you think that aquaculture on a large scale can be sustainable. Um, agriculture at a large scale, I mean, aquaculture at a large scale has the same problems as agriculture at a large scale. Once you're talking about large scales, um, some habitat has to disappear for the aquaculture to occupy its place. In the case of shrimp, it's mangrove forests, coastal forests where you can get a farm. Could argue that in Iowa there's almost no forest left in Nebraska too because it's all cornfields and that used to be a very wild place. Now it's a well managed, non managed cornfield. Same problems up with agriculture. Now that's different from a very small scale mussel farm in a small bay. That's not the massive uh, shrimp farms that we're talking that you can see from satellite picture that basically cut down forests in large amounts. And that's the problem of marine agriculture that takes place in coastal places. If it's not tourism, like here in South Carolina, it's aquaculture facilities, but coastal habitats are really in danger, specifically mangrove forests because of that. If it's not hotels, it's the shrimp farms, and very few mangroves are left. Do you think it's worth it um, to use that arable land for shrimp farms? Oh, uh, it's just saltwater fishes, and they don't like they don't like. So almost all the aquaculture that can be done is being done. I mean, it's very hard. Usually, high end aquaculture is not work that well. Very specific small markets, but from an economic perspective, if you look at any American agriculture company, they all start with great ideas. 
I don't know of a single company that lasts more than 20 years. I mean, it's going to go down and then have some business problem, market problem. Um, I have a question about, so you kind of touched on this, um, kind of touched on how the demand for a higher, more sustainable product is driving up prices. So since um, a lot of us is directly consuming it and having the money to buy that more sustainable product, how do we ensure that people that might depend on fishing for their own, um, for their own seafood, how do we ensure that they also have access to um, more sustainable That's the complex question. There's so many fishes out in the world, and the demand has been increasing. Good data here so far. Demand for fishes is growing at 3.2 annually in the world line. So the demand is going up. Now it's very different demands. The United States demand has been increasing for high-end fish, high-quality fishes. Americans eat mostly two-thirds of the fish at a restaurant, and only one-third bought in the market. In the rest of the world, it's usually the opposite, with the exception of Europe couple places, most of the fish is bought at a market and fresh. So it's a more lower end fish, just got caught more locally or got caught by a big industrial fishery. Um, of the eight most caught species in the world, as I said, there's two tuna species that go almost exclusively to canning. canning. We buy them in the United States, They're the canned tuna that you buy. Almost all the other ones are call it low quality fish that end up going to fish meal, fish oil, or are sold locally fresh for local market. And any grouper in the world most likely is not eaten locally. In, in the third world, it ends up somehow in China, Japan, United States, or Europe. Uh, this is from Garth, I, I guess. So, um, a practical question Costco sells frozen fish that is specifically wild caught. Do you have any idea whether that's true? Uh, almost, I mean, if you go to any supermarket in the United States, I would say, you might correct me, 90% of the fish there, 95% of the fish there have been frozen. And the moment you're buying it, it's not frozen anymore, yeah. but it has been frozen. And that's more than anything a transportation preservation thing, yeah. typical of the United States. Now, other cultures have a great appreciation for true fresh fish, for example, Europe. But a European is willing to pay a lot higher price for a fresh fish than a frozen. They're changing too because the access to fresh fish is just diminishing. But, but I'm asking about the wild caught like, on these packages of frozen fish in Costco. Many of them could be sustainable. Yeah. I mean, they, they come from a good place. There's yeah. a lot of uh, some of the best fish is just frozen. The best way to freeze a fish is yeah. minutes after catching on it on board the boat. Yeah, yeah. and the yeah, technology is there. Amazing. We have time for one more question. Um, so I saw a documentary recently about um, a lot of like coastal African countries have problems because their states are too weak to regulate their waters. Um, and it's ironic because people are starving because of malnutrition and can't get enough to eat um, and enough good quality food to eat. Um, and they have fishermen going out into their own waters, and then they have to compete with um, international boats from Europe, China, all over the place. Um, and people are fleeing as refugees on these boats, taking their fishing boats and going to Europe um, to try to escape. But they're unwelcome in Europe, but their fish is, of course, welcome. Um, are there any international organizations to help these states manage other countries coming in and, and in international waters to, to try to prevent overfishing in places like this that don't have the infrastructure to, to manage it themselves? The problem is those, um, those big companies usually are paying the country for fishing rights. So if you talk with the government, they say, like, no, no, they're fishing here illegally. They're getting basically a lot of money, a lot of permits. They sometimes hire local people to man the boats, but now, certain countries have banned these big companies. Uh, Palau Islands is a whole country located near the Philippines. They have banned big commercial fishing. They happen to have a huge diving tourism and diving industry, and they've decided that they're going to survive as a diving mecca and local fish for local consumption, local restaurants for the diving industry. So they have their own 
way up than many other Pacific countries, for example. It's the only way that the country actually makes any money is by selling their fishing rights to big corporations. So, so is that the fish that we eat on our plates, is that not contributing to that problem? Sometimes, yes. So, I mean, I kind of feel like in our country, what's the reason we're eating the fish? It's probably palate pleasure. Uh, we're certainly not now now nourished like the people in the countries you were mentioning earlier. So we're, we're basically weighing palate pleasure over social justice and sustainability. Sometimes yes, yeah. but sometimes you're helping people living. I mean, there's a whole commercial people that make a living out of this, and that's their jobs. And you stop eating their fish, they are out of a job. So. Thank you. Do you panelists have anything, any final thoughts to add?